Well, it is part two. I'm reading a very interesting book. One of my dear friends wrote a book. In fact, he's written over 50 books, almost 55, 57 books. His name is Dr. R.T. Kendall, pastored one of the great churches really on the planet, Westminster Chapel in downtown London. And in fact, you want to mark this down now. One of the great things that, that you could be part of, December 16th, that's a Sunday, Dr. R.T. Kendall is joining us here for all four services. He is going to be here all four services. If you want to know anything about him, probably his most iconic book is Total Forgiveness. Total Forgiveness. I'd encourage anyone that is on a journey of forgiveness, read Total Forgiveness by R.T. Kendall. Probably one of the great Bible uh, expositors, which means go word by uh, verse by verse, and he'll be with us on December 16th. Well, I'm reading a book he's asked me to read. He just put it out called Whatever Happened to the Gospel, which is such an important topic, especially with what we believe here, because here... At, at, at OSC, we're, we always feel like there's a four-step journey that we're always wanting to bring you on. We want people to know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and to make a difference. That means on Sundays, when we talk about knowing God, we want people to be born again. We want people to leave this place knowing God, not going, hey, this is a great church. As great as the music is, and Grant, and the team, and they, they do a great job, all of that's fantastic. We want you to leave here with one thing, that when you die, you know you're going to heaven. That's really important important to us. Number two is we talk about finding freedom. I'll talk to you about small groups in just a few moments about connecting, but we feel like that's where people find life. They'll find freedom is when the church gets smaller into small groups. And this is where you can go to oscgroups.com and join one of the 210 groups that we have. But then there's three, Sally talked about growth track, step four today, which is probably one of the most exciting ones, which you get to kind of get off the bench and get into the game. And uh, you get a touch on the ball is what you get ready to do and get ready to score on because every one of the people in this place all you dream teamers are amazing because really what you do sometimes people look right up here and think well it's it's the guy who's speaking that Sunday it has nothing to do with that there is over a hundred volunteers that make it happen every single Sunday and then finally it's that's where we come to the dream team which is to make a difference but one of the great things is is that when it comes to knowing the gospel R.T. Kendall said why don't you take a look at this tell me what you think and as I'm reading this book called whatever happened to the gospel here's what I started to realize as I as I was having questions I was putting little things on the side notes and then I said oh let me just ask R.T. so I I would text him or I would call him and go, what did you mean by this? Why this? How do I apply this? What was, what was this situation that was going on here? And what was exciting to me was, was to read a book and to know that the author is a friend and he's alive because I read a lot of dead people. And so to, to read somebody who is alive and a friend was, was really cool to me and to get his commentary on the very words that he wrote. But there's something even more amazing and it really is about a book that that's thousands of years old, and it's called the Bible. Can I tell you this? The author of the Bible is still alive, and you can talk to him, and you can even ask him questions today. That's what makes the Bible, and that's what makes God so incredible. It's men, talk about the bestseller in all of human history. It is the Bible, and this is where God begins. And I want you to get this now, because there's a, there's a huge point here. Because when you read the Bible, the Bible is God speaking to us. Now, here's what's important. The Bible is the word of God or the words of God or the speech, the speaking of God. That's what the Bible is. Some people call the Bible the word of God. It's God speaking. It's God's, God beginning to talk through the, the, the written pages of the Bible. Now, here's what's really important as we're dealing with the series of Words Matter. Pastor Chris touched on this a little bit. Jesus said there is a connection. I want you to jot this passage down because Jesus said there is a connection between words and heart. That things that are spoken really come from a source. And there's something here. So you cannot, listen to me close, you can never separate what's said here from what's down here. These two things are always connected. So here's what, in fact, what Jesus said, I, wanna, I want you to see it, and it's going to be reworded in different translations, but I want you to see what Jesus said. These are Jesus' words, Luke 6.45. Listen to what he says. The Living Bible says it like this. Whatever is in the heart overflows in the speech. Listen to this, the way this one says it. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. And then the contemporary version says it like this. Your words show what's in your heart. 
Boy, that's, how many know that's pretty intense? <laughs> because really what it's telling us was, your words are the showroom, but your heart is the stock room. It has to find what's here finds it's all the words and everything. All the resources come from down here. So now here's the part I want you to speak, I want you to get with me. Here's the big point. If the Bible is God speaking, the word of God, now this, get this now because this is gonna be what I'm gonna deal with. If the Bible is God speaking and when any of us, including God, speaks, they reveal their heart. So just bear with me, words and heart, connection. If the Bible is God's words, and when people speak words, they're revealing your heart, this is it, get ready now, then the word of God is the heart of God. The word of God is God's very heart for us. I am going to say that over and over again until we get that, that every time, here's what I want you to realize, folks. When you read that Bible, and, and I mean, I'm looking around going like, people today, they, nobody brings like a Bible. They bring it, it's their phone. How many have a Bible? Would you hold it up? Come on, can you give it up for those three people that, oh no, there's more today. This is the older, come on, give it up for those that still, and I know we have it on our phone or iPad, I get that. But here's what's incredible, is that I want you to see the Bible not as words, but I want you to see it as a person sharing their heart with you. That's really what the Bible is. Because if all you see it as words, then it just becomes like literature. And, but when you see it and going, wait a second, God's word is God's heart. Because people speak out of the abundance of their heart. These words express what's inside of here. And if that Bible is God's word, then these words are God's heart. And that's what becomes so important. So that's why, always remember, the tongue, get this down, is the ambassador of the heart. That's really what it is. The tongue is the ambassador of, of the heart. So when I or you open up our Bible and I'm reading the Bible, I'm really reading God's heart. Let me say that again. When I read the Bible, I'm reading God's heart. I'm reading about what God thinks and what is important to him. If I wanna know what God thinks on a topic, I go to his words. If I wanna know what God's heart is on a topic, I'll begin to go to his words. And this is why words matter. Talk is not cheap because talk comes from the heart. Talk is never cheap. Don't let anybody tell you that. Because words come from the heart. This is what's going on inside of here. And so that's why if we're going to deal with words matter in this whole series, I thought who better to start with than what God, how God speaks and what God says. Because the heaviest words that could ever be spoken are God's words. Why is that important, Pastor Tim? Jot this down. Number one, because the Bible, which is God's words, is timeless. It's timeless. It's, it, or if I could put it another way, jot this down. Truth, truth has no expiration date. Truth has no expiration date. You know, every single morning, I get up and I have this large, large 155 pound beast breathing on me going, take me out, take me out. We have a 155 pound dog. Someone was asking us, what kind of dog? Um, it's, it's a Bernice mountain dog and every morning he's gotta go out. So when I'm, after I take him out, sitting in front of my house is a newspaper. I've been getting it since I've been a freshman in college, which is a couple years ago. So I've been picking up the newspaper every single morning. I've been getting the Wall Street Journal since I've been a freshman high school because a, because a finance teacher told me to get the Wall Street Journal and read the, the left side and you'll always know what's going on in the world. So I get it. But here's what I've noticed about the newspaper. Every time I pick up that newspaper, Every day, I pull it out of the cover and read it. Let me just tell you something interesting. The words change every single day. There's things that are happening. Here's the greatest thing about the Bible. When you open it up, it's the same words because truth has no expiration date. When God speaks, it, what he said 2,000 years ago is still true today. That's what makes God who he is. See, David said it like this in Psalm 119, verse 89. He says, what you say goes, God, and stays as permanent as the heavens. Your truth, I love this, never goes out of fashion. It's up to date as the earth when the sun comes up. Your word and truth are dependable as ever. That's good stuff. That his word doesn't change. But the second thing which I think is important is this. Jot this down. Is not only is, is, is it the Bible timeless, but the Bible is truthful. Keep this in mind. Everyone in this place is entitled to their own opinion, but not everyone is entitled to their own truth. 
You can, you can be here and have your own opinion. That's not a problem. But when you hear things like this, this is where things get weird in this culture today is when people go, well, you have your truth and I have my truth. Mm-mm. That's your opinion. There's only one person that tells the truth all the time. His name is God. And here's what you have to remember. Psalm 119, 160, jot this down. This is what David says. Your words all add up. And when you add up 66 books of the Bible, he says it equals one thing. The sum total, that's truth. And every time you turn to the word of God, you're going to end up with truth. When you turn to man, you're going to get some opinions and sometimes strong opinions, but you're going to get opinions. When you turn to God, you're always going to get the truth. And because God's word is timeless and because God's word is truthful, I think the Bible has to also be, drop this down, has to be treasured. It has to be treasured. We have to begin to see it as something really valuable. David saw it like this. In fact, I, I want to read to you three verses just really quickly right in a row because David begins to start comparing it and saying, man, I'm choosing this over the, I'm choosing this, I'm choosing God's word over this. I'm choosing God's word over this. Let me explain to you because you'll see it better explained as I read the passages. He says this in Psalm 119, and you're going to see a lot of Psalm 119 because that is the largest chapter in the Bible. It's literally the center of the Bible, and of the 172 verses in there, 170 of them use some form of the Bible or the Word, use commands, testimonies, law. There's no other place in the Bible like that. Psalm 119, verse 72, truth from your mouth means more to me than striking it rich in a gold mine. That's what he says. Look look at those words, means more to me. Let me give you another one, 119, 103. This is a Louisiana verse. Your words are so choice, so tasty, I prefer them to the gumbo that my mom makes. That verse, the message says, I prefer them to the best home cooking. How many have some family that can make some good gumbo or some good jambalaya? And David says, I prefer to read your word than to even get the best meal. And then listen to this one, Psalm 119, 127. God, I love what you command. I love it better than gold and gemstones. He says, God, I honor everything you tell me. Did you see what he just did? Look look at what he's doing. Because in these three verses, he says, your word, he says this, means more to me than, and then he puts it in there. He says, your word, I prefer to these things. Your word, I love it better than, do you see what he was doing? He was saying, take the most important things of your life and he says I'd rather end up with truth and the word of God every single time he says because your word is timeless and because your word is truthful I would rather take it every single time in fact I want to just give you a a, a bit of a challenge and and my goodness this is something I think for all of us we, we would be we would do better and move the ball down a little bit more because when you think of all those words God I like your word more than I I love your word more than I prefer it this is what I want to challenge you with in January worry. We're going to take a little bit of a journey going into 2019, and we're going to take you on a journey through the Bible. We're going to walk through and read the Bible together and go through some stuff that I want to get you ready for. But how about taking a journey and getting a little bit of an on-ramp? It may take you five, six, seven minutes a day, and it's just this. How about just, just for the next hundred days, which gets us to, to January 1st, how about we just read a chapter a day, six minutes? Pastor Tim, why is that important? God's word is God's heart. Why wouldn't you want to get what God thinks about things in you? God's word. So a challenge to literally say, man, I, I think I can do that one challenge. How many, how many would say, you know what, Pastor Tim? I think I could give that a try. Just one, six, seven minutes before I leave. How many would be willing? Would you hold up, would you hold up your hands? Okay, keep them up because we're taking, we have cameras going all over the place and we'll be sending you something in the mail going like, are you reading? Just six, seven minutes. Pastor Tim, why? Because it helps you to begin to understand what God thinks. I mean, you know what you're beginning to do when you do that? You're saying this, God, I wanna treasure you more than Fox News and ESPN. God, I prefer your word over social media before I tweet, blog, or post. God, I love it better than your most. Some of you going like, this has been a good message until this right here. Because you know what we're saying? Is that before you post or look at anything else, you go, I gotta get what God's heart is this first. It's making a decision, because the challenge is this. Before I go to any of these good things, they're not bad, before I go to any of these good things, I've decided to treasure the Bible more and read one chapter so I can hear the heart of God every single day. 
Do you know what you would do for your soul? I mean, my goodness, to say, wow, God, this, this, this is, th- that would be an amazing day that you can hear his heart every single day. That's like, man, the culmination of one weekend with LSU, UL, and the Saints all winning at the same time, that would be a miracle. And so this is what God is going. He's going, let me tell you what I can do if you just open up your heart. And just like I had direct access to an author, so do you do. Direct access to God himself. Because when we begin to open up that word, we find out what God thinks. And I wanna just do that for the next few moments. Give me just the next 15 minutes. I wanna, I wanna just take three things that I want us to see what God thinks about. What God, how, or how God thinks. And I think these three things, they're gonna seem almost um, totally at polar opposites. But as we begin to kind of unpack this, I think we're gonna find that there is a correlation here. So I wanna take three things today that, that we need to know what God thinks and how God thinks. So let me, let me help you. Let's, let's ask God and use his word because God's word is God's heart. His word is his heart. So let's see what his heart is thinking and start with number one. Number one is this, God, what do you think about me? I think it's a question sometimes we don't even ask because we, don't, we think we know. We think we're just going like, man, God is just, you know, he's kind of just upset with me or he's just really frustrated going like, you should be better. And can I just tell you, if you haven't read his word, then you may not know what his heart is about you. And I wanna give you one of the most, man, if you wanna start with a chapter tomorrow morning, this will get you out of bed and get you to work when you realize what God thinks about you. Can I, let me read this to you. Here it is, Psalm 139. It says this, oh Lord, you have examined my heart and you know everything, <clears throat> everything about me. You know what he was saying? Every part and what he's about to tell you after this is about to be Some of the most amazing things, listen to this. You know when I sit or stand, when far away you know my every thought. He says, you chart the path ahead of me. You tell me where to stop and rest. Every moment you know where I am. You know what I'm gonna say before I even say it. He says, thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. And some of you are really complex. It's amazing to think about. Your workmanship is marvelous and how well I know it. You were there while I was being formed in utter seclusion. You saw me before I was born, I love this, and scheduled each day of my life before I began to breathe. Every day was recorded in your book. And then my favorite part, how precious it is, Lord, to realize you're thinking about me constantly. I can't even count how many times a day your thoughts turn towards me. And when I woke this morning and went to the 1130 service at OSC, you are still thinking of me. How amazing is God? He was saying, you are the only one I made and then I broke the mold. You are unique, you are special. God was saying, there is no one like you and I think about you every day. And I think Max Licato was right when he said this, if God had a refrigerator, your picture would be on it. If he had a wallet, your photo would be in it. He sends you flowers every spring, a sunrise every morning and face it, God is crazy about you. That's what he thinks. How amazing is that? That you weren't an accident. You weren't mass produced. You're not an assembly line product. Listen to me closely. You were deliberately planned, specifically gifted, and lovingly positioned on this earth. You are not an accident. God thinks about you right now. He is not, look at me, he is not frustrated with you. He loves you and thinks the best about your life. He really does. But sometimes, how many know your thoughts can get a little funky? Anybody know that? That's why we ask you at times to get in a small group because sometimes it's God telling us and sometimes it's God telling us through the people that are in this very place. There's 210 stinking groups, maybe not stinking, but there's 210 groups. What, 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 what is it? There's, not, there's nothing there for you? Because when my thoughts get out of at crazy, I need people sometimes to help me think right again, to bring me back online and to go, Tim, you got off the rails a little bit. This is what God thinks about you. 
Man, when we connect you with a small group, all you have to do is go to oscgroups.com. We connect you with some amazing people that when we get crazy, God, we're reminded by them and through them what God actually thinks about us. What does God think about me? Look at me, folks. He's crazy about you. He loves you. He really does. He's not frustrated and he's not angry with you. But I will tell you the polar opposite of what he really is angry at, what he's ticked at. Because, because just as passionately as he loves, I wanna kind of switch it and literally make a giant U-turn and tell you what he's really ticked off at. God, what do you think about, here it is, number two, what do you think about sin? Ooh, as much as he's like going, he's going like, you know, Pastor Randy, Polly Moore. I mean, as he's just going like, I love them, I love them, I love them. When he thinks about sin, he's just going like, mm, that's really upsets me. How, how come, Pastor Tim, how come? Let me explain it to you this way. Asia, Asia Lee was just a 17 year old senior in high school that was from the Athens, Georgia area. And so she decided with all of her girlfriends and they were just kind of horsing around and she decided, as they're at Six Flags over Georgia, two fences there, she climbs over both fences, June, as she climbs over them, the Batman roller coaster begins to come down in a, in a spot that was designated that you cannot go there, jumps over the two fences, and boom, 17-year-old, her life's gone, just like that. Roller coaster just hops over the fences that were there to protect her because it says, enjoy the ride, enjoy the ride, but don't climb over the fence. And literally, sin, sin is when you climb over the fence and try to find life where God goes, you won't find life there. You're gonna get hit by Batman's roller coaster. And what you think is, this is what ticks God off. The people that he loves passionately, hopping over the fence, trying to find something that God goes, it's not there. Stay with me. I'm telling you that what you think is, a, what you think is like, hey, he's trying to hold us off. Man, why do they put these fences up? Is to protect you. That's what he did. See, see, here's the part I want you to understand how important this is. I, I want to give you an example. And this is going to sound... You're gonna go like, man, this church is just, you know, so angry, and we're not angry. I, uh, if, you have to understand, I, I, just because I spit doesn't mean that I'm angry with you, I'm not. But here's the deal, listen to me. Here's a fence that we see being crossed every time, and it's God going, it, it's, it's not found there. And, I've wa and I watch this all the time, is people think that, that to, to have intimate relationships with one another outside of the boundaries and the fence of marriage is okay. That fence was set there to protect you and to protect your life. To have intimacy, to have sexual relations outside of the boundaries, the fence line that God has set up called marriage. He says, you're gonna hurt people. What you think is, well, well I love them. Oh, he's so hot. He, it does, that doesn't give you the, I, that I can cross over the fence or everybody else, this, no, I know he loves me. I know this is gonna be okay. And I'm telling you, it's just a matter of time and bam, Batman roller coaster gets you. And, and some of you are going like, that just seems so, okay, listen, God's fences is God's protection because of God's love for us. When those fences are set up, God's just going, I want you protected. And folks, I, I'm just telling you, I, I, I have told students, I've told, I've told adults, I've told people that have, that have been married, out of, I've told folks every age group you can imagine, you can't do it without getting hit. If there's not a ring, if there's not a commitment and you're not married, then stay within the fence. Stay within the fence. Some of you going like, I'm just telling you. Because no, and, and so let's be really, really clear here. Don't, because you're not going to say on my watch, you didn't know. You now you know. Here it is. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3, and 4. Sex within the boundaries of the covenant of marriage is what God has designed. Outside of that, you're going to get hit. There's a roller coaster. People are going to get hurt. Well, I didn't die, but you can get hurt. And it begins to take away and doesn't give to you. 
That's what we think, that we can get more on the other side of the fence. I'm telling you, nothing is further from the truth. It's as dumb thinking as this story I read of this criminal who tried to rob a Circle K some years ago. Listen to how dumb this is. So this guy goes, I need money. I'm gonna go into Circle K. I'm gonna give the guy, I'm gonna get a pack of gum, give him $20. When he opens up the register, I'm taking the money and I'm out of there. Seems genius. Goes into Circle K, $20, pack of gum. And when the guy opens up the register, grabs everything, goes out. The problem was there was only $14 in the register, which means there's a net loss of $6 for the criminal. And understand that that's what happens. You pay too much and you don't get back when you cross over the line when God has set up. Or if I could say it this way, sin will take you further than you wanna go, keep you longer than you wanna stay, and cost you more than you want to pay. That's why God hates it. He begins to tell us that as passionately as I love you, I hate it because of what sin does to the people that I passionately love. That's why he hates it so much. He goes, if I'm thinking about you every single day, I'm thinking of you, don't cross over, don't try to find life outside of me is what God is saying. And why is this important? Let me close with this and we'll be done. So God, what do you think about me? God, what do you think about sin? But here's the issue. The sin issue has to be addressed because of one word, forever. Forever. So I wanna ask this question, number three. God, what do you think about forever? Or the Bible would call it eternity. What do you, what do you think about forever? Um, another way to ask it is what happens after I die? Does, does life go on? I've, I've got two friends, I'll tell you the second one in a second, that have two weird hobbies. I don't even know why I'm friends, but two weird hobbies. Here's the first one. I have a friend that when he goes and travels around the world, he goes to cemeteries and takes pictures of memorable tombstone heads, epitaphs, takes pictures of them. So I'm pretty sure he was the one who told me the story. He says there's one tombstone, he says, that caught his attention, and here's what it said on the tombstone. It said these words, as you are now, so once was I. As I am now, you are sure to be. So may I say, as now I lie, prepare yourself to follow me. I'd be going like, let's move on to the next one. (laughs) I'd be going like, this is a little bit too much right now. As you're taking pictures with your iPhone and going like, so he told the story, he said, someone wasn't really, didn't really like those words. Let me read the words again. Go back, go back. As you are now, so once was I. As I am now, you are sure to be. So may I say, as now I lie, prepare yourself to. He said, someone didn't like that and added, took up some chalk and wrote underneath it and said this, to follow you, I'm not content until I know which way you went. (laughs) Because that really is the ultimate issue. It's not I die, it's where will I live forever? Or understand this, because the Bible gives us directions on how to live forever. Let, let me read them to you. This is, this is God's heart on forever. This is God's mind. Remember, God's word is God's heart. God's word is God's heart. Why? Because when you speak, it comes from the heart. God's word is God's heart. So what does it say? Here it is, Romans 3, 21. But now God has shown us a different way to heaven. What is it, Pastor Tim? Not by being good enough. Boy, that should be a sledgehammer for us. Not by being good enough and trying to keep his laws but it's a new way. Though he goes, it's not really new for the scriptures told about it long ago. Here it is. God says he will accept and acquit us, forgive us, declare us not guilty if, 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 if we trust Jesus Christ to take away our sins, we, and we all can be saved in this same way by coming to Christ, no matter who we are or what we have been like. That's good news. This is God giving us directions to heaven. This is him telling us where to go. See, the only sin he's telling us that can be in heaven is forgiven sin. Every one of us are sinners. 
But unless that sin is forgiven and dealt with, we will never, ever get there. That's why, here it is, listen, listen to this, folks. The most important question I can ask you today. Here's the most important question. Listen to me close. Where will you be in a hundred years from today? So you're like, man, I'm, I work out. I'm gonna be, no, you're not gonna be here. I don't care. You're like, man, I don't eat red meat. You, you're still not gonna be here. I got a membership at Reds. We won't see you. Hundred years from today, where are you gonna be? This is a huge question. And we've got to answer that question because the word forever is a real word. And that's why we have to get this right because of this word forever. Okay, weird friend number two. Here it is. Weird friend number one, um, tombstones. Weird friend number two, he collects Christian bumper stickers. So, okay, don't even ask. Okay, so I'm cutting them off soon. So here's, here's, here's my favorite my favorite Christian bumper stickers that he had. Here, here we go. Number one, honk if you love Jesus. Text if you want to see Jesus. Put your phone down, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, I like this one. Don't let my car fool you. My treasure is in heaven. That means if you're driving some junky car. Uh, number three, I like this one. God answers knee mail. I like that one. God answers an email. This one is really cool. People use duct tape to fix everything. God used nails to fix everything. That one's pretty good. This, this is awesome. As long as there are tests, there will always be prayer in our public schools. It doesn't matter what the Supreme Court, if you got a biology test, oh Jesus, help me Jesus. So there will always be tests in our schools, no matter what the courts vote. Two more, number th uh, two more, here we go. Be an organ donor, give your heart to Jesus. And then my favorite, here it is. How will you spend eternity, smoking or non-smoking sex? <laughs> My job, my job is to get you to the non-smoking section, okay? That's what my job is. My job is to get you into the right place. So right along with that question that we close with is this. If, if the first question is where, where will I be 100 years from today? This is the other question you gotta answer. The question is this, who is responsible for my sins? That's a huge question. Because if you're trying to be good enough, that means you want to take responsibility for it, which is not very smart. Because this, and, and I want to say this, 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 is, this is just real. And so let me just say this. What God is trying to tell us is you must fix the sin issue, not the church issue. Do you understand what I'm saying? Because people think if I get to church, it's all good. That's not what the Bible says. Because we think, man, I'm in church. How, why are you going to heaven? Go to church. Can I tell you, you could be going to church and not fix the sin issue. Because this is, this is what we think. Some people think, I'm here, so that means the issue is fixed. Mm -mm. There's something, there is something wrong starting with me. There is something fundamentally wrong called sin. And I've got to answer this question. One, if forever is real, if God, here it is, if God passionately loves me, well, God, how do you feel about me? I passionately love you. I'm thinking about you. God's going, I'm thinking about you. When you woke up and go, I think I may go to OSC. Uh, maybe I should. God goes, I'm thinking about you. I can't stop thinking about you. Number two, God goes, let me tell you what really uh, angers me all the time. And that's sin. Why? Because it's messing up the lives of those that I passionately love. And because the main thing that it's doing is it's holding them back for the third word, which is forever. What do I think about you? I'm thinking about you all the time. You'd be on God's refrigerator. Two, I hate sin. It's people crossing the fence and they're thinking they can do this thing called life without me. But three, I gotta fix that so I can get them to the forever part. So where will you be a hundred years from today? Where will you be? And the question is followed up by who's responsible for my sins? This is heavy, but this is real. This is, this, is, this is what the Bible says. Remember, God's word is God's what? It is, it's God's word is God's heart. And this is what the Bible says, that sin has to be responsible for. And he says, sin, this is the tough part. So listen close. God says in his word, there are two ways whereby God deals with sin, either the fires of hell or the blood of Jesus. I, I wish I could tell you it's anything different than that. This is what he says. 
He says, but my son came and died for you. That's how passionately God loves you and me. That's why, listen, why did Jesus die on the cross? The death of Jesus is so we might go to heaven and our sins are forgiven. It's not you by being good. See, that's why, chop this down, heaven is a free gift. Heaven is not given to you as a reward for being good. Man, I can't make it any clearer. See, some of you think heaven is a reward because I don't say things anymore. I don't do that anymore. I stopped killing people, which is good. Stop killing folks. Okay, that's good. All that stuff is good, but that's not what gets you there. Because look at me, folks. None of you could be good enough to get to heaven. You, none of us could be good enough to get to heaven. That's why heaven is a gift. And since it is a gift, it has to just simply be received. That's it. It has to be received. Pastor Tim, I don't feel good enough. Perfect candidate for heaven. Pastor Tim, I messed up. Perfect candidate for heaven. Then, then, Pastor Tim, I'm, okay, God loves me, hates sin, people crossing over the line, but what, what, how do I get to forever? This is what Jesus said, and then we close. John 3, 3, Jesus said it like this. I'm telling you the truth. No one can see the kingdom of God without being born again. That's what he said. He said, it has to start with this, not fixing the church issue. Now, okay, we're in church. Jesus didn't die to get you to sit in church for an hour. Can we just be honest? He didn't sit there and go through all that pain and suffering, die on a cross, get nails hammered into his hand, die, crown of thorns, spear stuck through his side, laid in the tomb for three days to go, oh, finally, they're going to church now for one hour. I came to this planet so they would attend church for an hour. That is not what he came to do. He came to have a relationship with you, number one, forgive your sin, number two, and that you would hang out with God forever, number three, called eternity. And he says, the way that happens is I need you to be born again. Born again, that's Jesus' words. It's not OSC words. Those are Jesus' words. And, and remember, if it's God's word, then it's God's heart. If it's God's word, it's God's heart. That born again word, John 3, 3, that's not, a, that's not an OSC word. It's not a Protestant word. It's not a Baptist word. It's not a Methodist word. It's not a Catholic word. It is a Jesus word. And the question just comes down to this. Have you had that second birth? H has that happened to you? Because somebody has to pay for your sin. Someone has to pay for it. Well, Pastor Tim, how, do, how does that happen? It is as simple as ABC. Just like we would tell our kids who are learning the alphabet, ABC, ABC, ABC. There are kids that know, don't know all their letters, but they seem like kids always start off with ABC, ABC, ABC. They know the, the three letters. And, it's, and I want you to remember those three letters. A, admitting I'm a sinner. Admitting that the sin issue is a problem that has to be fixed and it's not fixed by church. Okay, how is it fixed? B, believing that Jesus died in my place, died the death I should have died and lived the life I should have lived and loves me so much, he wants me to be with him forever and C, confessing him as Lord. You're in charge of my life now. I want you to bow your head with me, please, as we close. As we finish here today, it is the most important question. Where will you be a hundred years from today? And the follow-up question, who's responsible for your sins? And Jesus says, I will take full responsibility. That's why I died for you. Because the people I passionately love are being absolutely destroyed by something I so passionately hate called sin. But because I want them to be with me forever, man, I've come to change everything. I want them to be born again. And today could be a brand new start for you. Today Today, you can answer that question. You can answer the question, where will I be in 100 years from today? I'm born again, I'm going to heaven. I'll be in heaven. I'm telling you, you ask me where I'm gonna be in 100 years, I'll be with Jesus. I'm gonna be in heaven. But some of you can't say that, but I wanna change that today. I want you to leave here so confidently going like, I know where I'm going. Pastor Tim How, I just simply wanna pray a prayer with you. I wanna pray a born again prayer with you. It's a prayer that says, I want this to be my second birth date, where I had a first birth date, today will become my second birth date. If Jesus says I need to be born again, then that's enough. In fact, he says in John 3, 7, you must be born again. So don't make an option what Jesus says is a must. And if you're here today and say, Pastor Tim, I want to start that journey today. I really do. I want to start that journey. If that's you, 
I'm not going to make you stand. I'm not going to make you walk forward. But if you're in this place today and say, Pastor Tim, I couldn't answer that question of where I'll be 100 years. But right now, I can answer because I want to start that journey. I want to be born again. I'm not perfect and you don't have to be. You just got to be honest. I've got a sin issue. Jesus said he'll stand in my place. I make you Lord of my life. Jesus said that's what you need. So if you're here today and say, Pastor Tim, when you pray that born again prayer, I want to be in that prayer. And if that's you, with every head bowed and every eye closed, with no hesitation, if that's you, I want you to raise your hand right now. Just say, put me in that prayer. Hold it up high, because I want to make sure I see every hand that's up. Keep them up high, because I'm going to count them. Keep them up high. I'm going to start from my left, your right. There's one, two, keep them up. Three, four, five, keep them up high. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, that's fantastic. 13, gotcha. You could put your hands down. Thank you. Thank you so much. And maybe you're sitting here today going like, that's it? That's all you want? That, that was it? That's all I'm going to ask you to do. That you're going like, I was a little nervous. I, sh- I should have raised my hand because I want to know today that I am born again. And Pastor Tim, I was a little nervous. Just ask one more time. I want to make that decision today. And if that's you and you said, I should have raised it, but I didn't, I want to give you just one more opportunity. If you did raise it, don't raise it again. But I just want to give a chance for some others that said, that's all, that's all I want you to do. And then we're all going to pray together. That's all we're going to do. If you should have raised your hand, you didn't. Would you hold it up now? Anybody else said I should have joined? Gotcha. 14, 15. Keep them up. Let me just make sure. 15. It's got you. 16. That's fantastic. 17, 18, 19, 20. That's awesome. You can put your hands down. Can we join with these? Let's go ahead and we can clap for those 20 folks.